All right, jump right into God's Word with me. Let's uh, look at John chapter 15. We're in a series of messages talking about vision. And so uh, here's what we've talked about. We've talked about we need, we need a foundation. We need the foundation of God. And God's Word is that foundation. We talked about that two weeks ago. Last weekend, we talked about we need the voice of God. And this weekend, we're talking about we need the heart of God. Uh, Let me just show you real quick. So our church, we're real big on vision. And uh, uh, how many of you, uh, just real curious, uh, how many of you this morning attended the starting point class this morning? Can I see your hands real quick? I know there were, I think there was 18 people. Uh, Thank you guys so much for attending that. So some of these things we're going to talk about, you've probably, you might even mirror up and go, oh, I see what they're talking about. So as a church, we look at vision as a threefold uh, triangle. Uh, we, we think about uh, vision like this. We, we, call, we talk about our virtues, we talk about our vision, and we talk about our values. How many of you know that's what we do as a church, all right? So, and let me, let me just describe for them briefly. All right, so our virtues are our foundational principles. These principles will not change. It is the things that we desire to put into ourselves as DNA. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to give you all of them. Right now, currently, uh, we have uh, eight words that we call foundational words for our church. Four of those words, you may know uh, specifically, we've we've added four new ones this year, but the first four are lordship, integrity, freedom, and excellence. It's things that we do as a church. We we count Jesus as Lord in everything we do. We try and do everything in, in an integrous way. We want people to experience freedom, including myself. I want to experience more freedom, and we want to do everything we can with excellence. Now, we've added four new ones this year, and I don't know if I can even remember them right now, but it's generosity, uh, communication, thankfulness, and look at it, Pastor David. You taught this this morning. Come on. This is a test. This is kindness. Thank you. Hey, you get a raise. So anyway, so. <laughs> All right. So uh, th- these are things that we call values of our church. We want to exhibit kindness and generosity, and we want to be good at communication. It's funny to me how uh, sometimes we think we're good communicators, and we just are not. And so it's, it's, a, it's a work and a progress to try and figure out how to become better communicators with each other. So these are values that we have. Uh, so we're talking about literally foundational principles. So if we're going to look at a triangle, think about the bottom side of that triangle as being the foundation. All right? This is a firm foundation that we're laying. All right? Now, one of the sides that goes up on that triangle is what we call vision. And, and so when we talk about vision, we're specifically talking about the voice of God. There is no way you can know what God wants you to do uh, if you don't have his voice. Let me, let me help you a little bit about that. So we are right now, next week we'll, we'll unveil some plans for you to see. Uh, but uh, we are in the process of looking at what it looks like for us to build another building on this property. And we'll talk about that next week. I don't have time to go into it, but think about this for just a second, right? Uh, it, someone says, well, how do you know when God is in building a building? Someone else, if, I, if you came from my roots and the background I came out of, they would say, well, just read God's Word. Just read God's Word. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I've read the entire Bible cover to cover, and I've never seen anything in there that said Life Fellowship needs to build this kind of building, and it needs to be this square footage. And uh, so you understand There are foundational things that God has given us, and those will never change, but we need the voice of God because there are things that are going on in our lives. Hey, look at there. There's a bottle of water underneath there. All right. There are things going on in our lives all the time that the Bible doesn't address. I mean, when do you do it? How much money should you put down? These are all questions that we need the voice of God to speak to us in our lives. Does that make sense? So that's this side of the triangle. The third side of that triangle is what we call uh, values. Uh, and again, I know in, in our society today, when we hear the word value, the first thing that we think of is we need to have family values. But that's not how I'm using the term. In fact, actually, we have switched the terminology of value uh, just in our modern time today. We've, we use the word value as talking about we need to have certain virtues. That's, see, the word virtue is really the word we, w- we really are looking for. What you refer to as values is the word virtue for us. But the word value is getting a good return on your investment. That's this side of the triangle. By the way, all three sides of the triangle are very, very important. So the values, if I were to say, what are the values of Life Fellowship? Well, the values are, uh, they involve three areas. They involve time, they involve talents, and they involve treasure. In other words, how do I get the best return on the investment that we're making? Uh, Again, if, if we build a building, 
That's an investment. Can we, can we agree with that? That's an investment. If we, if we win someone to Jesus, that's an investment, right? Well, how do I get the best return on the investment that we're making? Uh, and, and let me say something about building buildings. Uh, I'm not big on building buildings. I, in fact, honestly, I, I, I think it's kind of like uh, the, the, uh, the necessary evil of what churches have to do. Because uh, I feel like sometimes you put tons and tons and tons of money into a church, but then what is the return on that? By the way, not that it's wrong to put money into something, but I'm telling you that if we get our eyes focused on the wrong thing, then we'll begin to reach the wrong goals. And the goal for us is not to reach buildings. The goal for us is to reach people. But sometimes you've got to have buildings to reach more people. Does that make sense? So think about this. How do I get a good return on my investment? Well, I'm always looking at, well, how much time is it going to take? Uh, how much... Uh, uh, how much uh, talent is going to be required for this, and what's the treasure that must be placed into it? So these are things, and this is how we determine how to, how to set things into our lives. You can do the same thing in your marriage. There should be some foundational principles in your marriage that helps you to know what you're going to do. There needs to be the voice of God in your marriage. Everyone see that? And where, where are we going to spend our investment the most. In other words, what, how much time do I need to invest in this area of our marriage? How much time do I need to invest in our children? What's the talents that are required to accomplish the goal that we set for ourselves? And how much money is it going to cost? By the way, if you don't know this, it costs money. Marriage costs money. <laughs> right? Okay. So how much money am I going to invest because, and how important is it? Does that make sense? Does everyone catch that? Okay, so that's what we're talking about. So tonight we're talking about we need the heart of God. And that's that third side of the triangle. What is God's heart? It's one thing to have his voice, but I'm telling you, if you don't have a good foundation and all you've got is his voice, well, that, that bottom is going to kick out and fall in. Uh, if you get two sides of the triangle and yet the foundation is not there, eventually it's going to fall in. If you have the voice of God and a good foundation, but you are not investing the way that you should, it's going to fall in. So all, all three sides of this are very important. So let's talk about the heart of God. So what is uh, God's heart? So look with me in John chapter 15 and look at verse 10, all right? Uh, if you keep my commandments you will abide in my love. I want you to think about this statement, and we're going to come and talk about it for just a second. Uh, if you keep my commandments. Well, I want you just to ask the question to yourself, what commandments is he referring to? Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. The word full there can literally be interpreted as the word complete. So that your joy can be complete. Okay, think about a three-sided triangle. Here's what he's saying. You need to complete the whole project. It's very, very important. So, that, so he, says, I wanna, he says, these things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. Uh, and and, and I, I love this line. He says, you are my friends. And, I, and if, he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. You are my friends if, I, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go out and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. This is, this is a different kind of fruit. It is not a fruit that spoils. It is a fruit that can remain. So that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. By the way, this is where, you know, it's funny. We, we are people who read things uh, and we hear what we want to hear in a passage. And here's what a lot of people hear, you know, because we're believers, we can ask whatever we want and he'll give it to us. It almost gets to the place where it's like uh, we're the puppet master and God's the puppet. And whatever we ask, he's going to do for us. That is not what this passage of scripture is saying. He's saying that if you do it the right way, if you, if you, if you obey my commands... If you, if you get your joy made full and made complete, he says, then whatever you ask, you'll only ask what I want you to ask. And when you ask it, I'm going to give it to you. 
That's very, very important we catch that statement. So he's not saying, uh, you know, that we ought to have a name it, claim it theology. He's saying that if you'll do things my way, whatever you ask, you'll be in my will already, and you'll only want to ask what it is that I want you to ask. And therefore, I can fulfill it, and I can complete it. So he says you can ask. That's, that's a great word. So think about this last little line, though. Verse 17 says, this I command you. Now remember I said that first opening line that we read there says, uh, he says, if you keep my commands. What are the commands of God? What is his command? Well, verse 17 is very clear. He says, this I command you, that you love one another. This is God's heart for us. Uh, so someone says, well, how do I know if I have the heart of God? So let me say this. Let me put, let me put this a little bit different. Really what we're talking about, we're talking about having the heart of God. We're talking about literally being a servant, being a servant of God. Now, it's interesting in this passage, he says, I'm not going to call you a servant. I'm going to call you a friend. But you go on in other places, and he says, but we're here. We've been called to serve. So it's great God refers to you as a friend, and the reason we serve him is because we are the friends of God. Aren't you glad we're the friends of God? I mean, if God be for you, who can be against you? How many of you are glad you're God's friend? Okay? It is a wonderful thing to be the friend of God. So it is it's an amazing thing. But that doesn't mean that just because we're his friend, we shouldn't serve. Uh, by the way, my wife is my best friend. Literally, in all the world, my wife is my best friend. I, I, I adore my wife. And I, I'm saying that tonight uh, not because I'm earning brownie points. She's not even here to hear this, all right? So maybe she'll listen to the podcast. But anyway... But uh, she, she literally is my best friend. But, well, listen, here's what best friends, best friends don't just let their friends serve them. Bre best friends serve one another. Are, are y'all following that? Okay, listen to me. Uh, you're in the church. We're family. Uh, many, many times I will pray in my prayers, God, thank you that I'm with my family. I am, not, I am not talking about, and I, I love my family, but I'm not talking about these guys. They're this, this front, some, of this, some of these guys on the front row are my family. You know, uh, some of my flesh and blood, you know, family. Some of these guys over here on this row, one of these people on this row is my family, you know. My son is somewhere in the building. I don't even know where he's at. He's pointing. Oh, they're over there. I don't know where over there is, all right? So, there's, but, so I have family that's here, but when I refer to family in the church, I'm not talking about uh, I'm not talking about my blood relatives. I'm talking about uh, that we are family through the blood of Jesus. Does that make sense? By the way, if we really are family, wouldn't we want to serve one another? Wouldn't we want to invest time in one another? Wouldn't we want to invest talent in one another? Wouldn't we want to invest treasure in one another? Is that right? Okay, you do it in marriage, don't you? And by the way, if you don't, you won't be long before you're in my office for counseling. <laughs> right? So we have to invest in one another. So it is it, really this third side of the triangle is all about service. So it is learning to be the servant of God. We're friends, but we serve one another. Does that make sense? So this is what we're talking about tonight. We need the heart of God. So how do you know if you're a servant? So I've got six questions tonight. And so this is a quiz pop quiz. Are y'all ready for the pop quiz? How many of you always like pop quizzes when you had them in school? How many of you liked them? I don't like y'all at all because I didn't like them. <laughs> but this is a pop quiz tonight. And so these are questions you can ask yourself to determine if you are a servant. All right. So uh, here's question number one. Uh, who am I doing this for? I want you to ask yourself that question. If I'm, you know, if I am serving, and hopefully every believer is serving. If you're not serving, you need to learn to serve. But I'm saying to you, when you do serve, who are you doing it for? Why are you doing it? So who am I serving for? Now, remember last week I told you that this week I'd come back and I would express something about 1 Samuel chapter 3. How many of you were here last weekend? How many of you were not here last weekend? Anyone want to admit it? Just check in. We actually had an amazing service last weekend, 1,136 people in our weekend services last weekend. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> That is, uh, that is our all-time high ever. And in fact, uh, our all-time high before that was last summer when we had Michael Jr. in for that big weekend. Remember that? And we topped that uh, on Easter weekend by almost 100 people. That's pretty amazing. So anyway, uh, so I remember last week I talked about 
uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, where Samuel heard the voice of God. Remember that? And, he heard, and so he went into Eli. Remember that? Okay, so let me read for you 1 Samuel 3, verse 1. I want you to pick up something real quick. Here's what he says. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli. And the word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. So last weekend, I said, I wanna, I'm going to say something this weekend about that. Okay, I want you to notice the first part of it. He says, now the boy Samuel was ministering to, let me, let me take out a word to help you see if you catch it. Uh, the boy Samuel was ministering to Eli. Is that what it says? No. Okay. I want you to get this. Notice what it says is the boy was ministering to the Lord, but who was he serving? Eli. By the way, when we do this for each other, we are doing it for the Lord. Uh, if you're one of our greeters in our church, thank God for you. But you're not doing it for me. And you're not doing it for those who are coming through the door. We're doing it for the Lord. Does that make sense? So who uh, am I doing this for? Hopefully you will say, I'm doing it for the great I am. That's really what I want. Uh, let me give you another verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 24 says, Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Here's what, here's what we're, that really sounds so foreign to us in our society today because most people today, they do things for their own good and they don't do it for their neighbor. Here's what the, verse, here's what the Word of God says, that when we do, try and do good, the only way we're really going to do good is if we're doing good for others. So let us do that good for our neighbors, for people who are around us. By the way, if you don't know this, God loves people. God loves people. So let me give you, here's, qu here's quiz question number two. You ready? Number two, am I doing this because I love God slash others? Uh, by the way, the two are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they both go together. Uh, am I doing this because I love God? Am I doing this because I love others? And by the way, if I love others, I'm loving God. Does, does that make sense? So uh, let me give you a verse of scripture about that. John 13, verse 34 says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, uh, if you have love for one another. Here's what this verse says. You can recognize other believers. You know how you recognize them? By their love for one another. I I'm telling you, I can literally, I, I, I literally, I can look at people and I go, you know what, I know they're a believer. There are people that there are times in my life I look at and I go, I don't know if, I, I don't know if they're a believer. I just don't know if they're a believer. And you know why? Because they don't display any love in their life. You can always point out a believer because you look at him and go, man, uh, it's funny. Uh, we were, Lisa and I were watching television one night, and we, were seeing, we saw this interview uh, with an actor, uh, a prominent actor out in Hollywood. And I was, we watched this interview. When I got finished, Lisa and I were talking. We said, you know what? I bet uh, that guy is a believer. I bet he's a believer because no one uses that kind of language who's not a believer. So Lisa uh, gets on. Uh, the encyclopedia of the millennium, you know, Google. And uh, <laughs> she looks, and sure enough, I, I mean, we couldn't find anything that said on this date he was saved, but he goes to a, a believing evangelical church in California. And we went, man, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that there are believers around the world. You can recognize believers, and you recognize them by their Love. So the question is, uh, am I doing this because I love God and because I love others? All right, so here's question three. You ready? Uh, why do I serve? Uh, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? What is the intent behind it? Why am I doing it? So uh, if you have your Bible, turn over to Mark chapter 10. Hopefully you have your place already found there. Mark 10 verse 42 says, calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, this is his disciples, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Okay, uh, In other words, the reason, their motivation behind what they do is so they can be in power and have authority. He says, you understand that Roman centurions and Caesars... Uh, the reason they do what they do is so they can be over people. They can lord it over people. He says, and their great men exercise great authority over them. But it is not this way among you. 
But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. By the way, let me just say real quick before I read this next verse. Uh, what is your heart motivation? Why are you doing? Why are you serving? And if your motivation is so that I can become greater, you're missing the point. Uh, the, 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 the goal is not so that I can become greater. The goal is so that Jesus can become greater. By the way, I say this as much to you as I say to me. The goal for me to preach every weekend is not so that Mark Allen can become greater. I, I, I hope you understand that about me. The goal for me to preach every weekend is so that the kingdom of God can become greater among his people. So he says, this is not the way it's supposed to be among you. Hey, watch verse 45. Uh, verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man, Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Okay, this is a great verse. And here's what the Bible says. Jesus set the greatest example for service that anyone could have. And what we ought to take from this is if Jesus can be a servant, not trying to make himself greater, but trying to bring greater kingdom to earth, shouldn't I also be about serving the Lord in the same way? Does that make sense? So why, what's our motivation behind it? Why are we doing what we do? Here, here's number four uh, question. Number four, uh, is my heart right? Is my heart right? Do I have the right kind of heart? Philippians chapter 2. I think that's the verse I told you all to turn to, isn't it? Okay, good. Hopefully you're at Philippians 2. All right, so Philippians 2 verse 5 says, uh, is my heart right? Have this attitude in yourself. Can we say that if you have the attitude of Christ Jesus in your heart, you would have a right heart? Is that right? If you have the right attitude. So he says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the, on the cross. Okay, uh, you want to know if your heart's right? Do you have the same attitude that was in Jesus Christ? In other words, this is not about you, but it is about the Lord. Let me give you another verse. Colossians 3 verse 12 says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart. Okay, can we say this is the right attitude to have? Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. In other words, uh, how many of you know that sometimes when we serve, unintentionally we offend people? Okay, okay. Uh, I, I'm going to ask a question, but I don't want to see one hand go up. And the question is, how, how many of you have I offended from here? Don't re I do not want to know about it. I do not want to know about it. But here, and here's the thing. The reality is we offend people. And sometimes we don't even intentionally do it. We don't even know that we have done it. But here's what the Bible says. When you, when you get an offense that comes against you, forgive in the same way that Jesus has already forgiven you. Have that attitude in yourself. Does, does that make sense? Okay, have this attitude within you. And then let me show you this. He goes on to say this, uh, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also you should. Verse 14, beyond all these things, beyond all these things, put on love, 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 which is the perfect bond of unity. You want, you want to know how the perfect... Uh, service works. You want to know how to have a perfect heart in you, how to have the heart of God? You learn to love people no matter what. And by the way, it's easy to love lovable people. Right? Okay. Uh, God didn't say put on the heart of love towards lovable people. He said love people. And there are some unlovable people, <laughs> difficult people, but by the way, just so you know, we're trying to reach them too. We're trying to reach them too. And the only way we will reach them is if we have a heart of love. So that's, how, do, how am I doing my service? Here's number five. Am I generous? Am I generous? Uh, 
uh, you know, last year we did an entire series with Pastor Robert Morris, and we talked about the blessed life. And I'm telling you, uh, it's interesting to me, people who catch this, who really understand what it means to be a tither, and it is no longer about the law. P please hear me. I, I, uh, I, I, you know, when we were growing up, we were told we needed to tithe 10%. Uh, I got two fifty a week for my uh, allowance. How many of you kids would like to get two dollars and fifty cents a week? Just asking the question. <laughs> That's about what I got for a weekly uh, allowance, and we put twenty five cents in the offering plate. That was ten percent. The reason I did it was because my dad said you're supposed to give ten percent back to God. So we did it. When I got married, uh, I stopped giving ten percent to God because I figured I had a better way. In fact, I even got trapped in this theology that we live under grace, therefore I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, well, you don't, if you, and by the way, if you have that attitude, you don't understand God. So, uh, just so you know. So, I, you know, we tithe, and so at some point, Lisa and I decided, well, we're supposed to tithe, we should be tithing, we need to tithe, and we began to tithe again. And, and so that was actually a time where God began to bless us. He really began to, to restore some things in our life. Well, there came a point in my life, uh, where, in Lisa and I's life, where we started talking about, you know, the reason we give 10% is because it is an issue of the law. And God says you have to give 10%. But it's really not a generous thing. And by the way, I, I'm not trying to put a word on you. I'm just saying this is what God did in us. And so God began to put on us that we need to up our tithe and get it to the place where we were giving. And, and the goal back then was that we would be tithing about 20% of our uh, income back to the Lord, giving the 20% back. It wasn't an issue of the law any longer. It was because we became generous. And so, you know, we, it didn't, we didn't do it overnight. You know, every year we'd add a little bit. You know, we went to 11%, and we went to 12%, then we went to 14%, and then we started stretching ourselves some more. We went to 16%. Uh, and so the goal, we've never had a goal beyond the 20%. We've never had a goal beyond 20% of giving on our income. But let me tell you, because we've become generous, we really, right now, this year, or last year, because you know, we got our tithing uh, statement, we weren't really even paying attention to it. We gave upwards of almost 25% of our income to the Lord last year. Now, listen, I'm not, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm not trying to get your kudos. I'm saying to you, we, we had to come to the place in our life where we became generous. Something uh, with a generous heart that God says, if you're generous, I can enter into the scene of your life. When you're selfish, God says, I can't do anything with you. So I'm telling you, one of the reasons we're blessed is because God put on our hearts to learn how to become generous. And it's not so much, did we get this amount? And we, did we make sure we stayed under this amount? We don't want to go over this. It's about how much more can we do? How much more can we do? That's a generous heart. Are you generous? Uh, I read this verse this week. I've, I've shared this with several people this week. I, I just love this. Proverbs 11, verse 24 says, uh, and by the way, I, re I was going to put verse 25 in my message, but Pastor David reminded me of what verse 24 said, so I went and read it, and I added it into the message too. So it says this, One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. Do you think generosity might be important? Uh, verse 25 says, A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. It, by the way, uh, mathematically, this does not make sense. I'm, I'm just telling you, mathematically, it doesn't make sense. But I'm telling you, in the kingdom of God, it makes a lot of sense. Because what God says, if you'll learn how to refresh others, I'll refresh you. Uh, by the way, would you rather be refreshed by others or be refreshed by God? That's not a hard question, people. <laughs> I'm telling you, God's refreshment is way better than the world's refreshment. And so it is not about what I can get. It's about what I can give because I want God to refresh me. I want the refreshing of God in my life. So am I generous? Here's number six. Last question on the quiz. Are you ready? By the way, how are you doing in the quiz? Anyone scoring 100 yet? All right. Number six. Uh, am I giving it my all? Am I giving it my all? And when I'm talking about there, I, I know the word giving is there. We, generosity is talking about giving. But when I say giving your all, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about are you giving of every part of you? We started this message talking about that I see this side of the triangle as being time, talent, and treasure. And here's what I'm trying to say to you. Just, uh, and I know people, I've actually had uh, people make this statement to me. Well, the reason I give to the church is so y'all can do it for me. Well, you're doing one portion <laughs> 
I mean, if you're giving, you're doing one portion of that side of the triangle. It's like putting a brick on the ground and saying that brick, that one brick will protect the rest of the house. I'm saying to you that it takes all three of these. God wants your time. He wants your talents. And he wants your treasure. And by the way, let me say it a different way. God doesn't need your time, your talent, and your treasure. He can do it without you. But he'd rather include you. Because the blessings come when we get involved with what God is doing. Does that make sense? So am I giving my time, my talent, and my treasure? Am I giving it my all? Let me give you one last passage of Scripture. Colossians 3, uh, verse 23 says, Whatever you do, do your work heartily. Is that pretty good? Am I giving it my all? Do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. So do it heartily. Work hard. Uh, I think we live in a generation today of people who will, uh, everything they do is to just barely scrape by, barely just do enough. I'm saying to you, that's not what a Christian is about. A believer who has God's vision in his life is willing to do whatever it takes to work hard. So let me ask you the question, are you giving it your all? Are you giving it your all? So here's the quiz. Here's the quiz. Six questions. And I'd ask you to do this. Grade yourself. Grade yourself. Where you sit right now. Uh, and about, you don't need to come tell me. You don't need to come tell anybody else. But it ought to be something in your own life where you go, huh, you know, uh, I'm doing pretty good on that number one thing. I'm kind of missing it in number two. You know, I'm about halfway doing it in number three. It ought to give you a picture of where you're standing right now in your service towards the Lord. And by the way, it's really, this is the coolest thing you'll ever hear. Okay, I want you, I want you to think about this. Uh, you're not born a servant. Let me say it one more time. Uh, it, you, if you're a parent, you already know this. Children are not born servants. Servants are made. You have to become willing, even to the point of death, to say, whatever it takes. Joshua said it this way, choose you this day whom you'll serve. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord.